Hey y'all, it's Kidney Cat, dietitian on a mission to improve your condition. If you have kidney disease and you have been instructed by your doctor or dietitian to follow a low phosphorus diet, this is the right video for you. Let's get into it. Phosphorus is an essential electrolyte mineral. It's needed for the structural integrity of the human body, for metabolism, for the creation of DNA and RNA, all kinds of great stuff. You might be asking yourself, what's the, what's the downside? Well, if you consume more phosphorus in your diet than you need, the kidneys, if they're healthy, would recognize this and start to filter that phosphorus out of the blood, send it down to the bladder where it's eventually gonna leave the body in the urine. However, if your kidneys aren't working very well, that phosphorus can start to build up to toxic levels. So what side effects can start happening will be um, itching, rash, joint pain, muscle cramping, or the most common symptom of all, no symptoms. Yes, you heard me right. The most common side effect of high phosphorus is not having a symptom at all. Unfortunately, it's gonna affect you in the long run, but not having a short-term symptom makes it easier for people to ignore their health care team's warnings. Whether you feel it or not though, high phosphorus is having an effect on the body. The body likes to have a balance between calcium and phosphorus in the blood, right? So when the phosphorus in the blood starts to get high, the body will pull calcium from the bones in order to maintain that balance. And when you're pulling calcium from the bones, it can lead to weak bones that break easily and are very difficult to fix. And that calcium floating around in the blood tends to settle in places where it doesn't belong, like the vascular system. This can lead to atherosclerosis, very hard for me to say, but that can result in strokes and heart attacks. And that calcium too can start to be deposited under the skin and create these horrible wounds, these sores that are very, very painful and very difficult to treat. It's called calciphylaxis. Unfortunately, by the time people start experiencing these horrible side effects, it's almost too late to do anything about it. It's just like saving for retirement. The more serious you are earlier on, the better off you're going to be in the long run, right? So let's talk about the different types of phosphorus in our food. Phosphorus can be found naturally in food. It's natural or organic phosphorus is found with protein in foods. So foods that have a lot of protein in them, like meat, eggs, beef, chicken, fish, those are going to have a lot of phosphorus. Dairy products like milk, yogurt, and cheese, ice cream, they'll have a lot of phosphorus. Vegetarian foods like beans, nuts, legumes, and even whole grains to an extent are gonna have phosphorus in them. So you might be asking yourself, do I need to restrict foods that are high in protein in order to keep my phosphorus levels low? And the answer is no, you don't. A lot of people are able to maintain their phosphorus at a good level without restricting these foods. So you, some people might have to, but most people don't. Researchers estimate that only between 40 to 60% of the naturally occurring phosphorus in food is actually absorbed into the blood. And if you're taking a phosphorus binder, that number goes down even further. But let's talk about the other type of phosphorus, inorganic phosphorus. Inorganic phosphorus or added phosphorus is found in a lot of processed foods. It can be used to color a food, prolong the shelf life, prevent powdery foods from caking together, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So this inorganic artificial phosphorus it makes up 50% of the phosphorus intake in Western diets. I'm talking about the US. And researchers estimate that between 70 to 100% of this phosphorus is absorbed. That's a lot. This is the type of phosphorus that we need to limit. Limiting this type of phosphorus is the single most important thing you can do for phosphorus control. 
So how do you tell if the food that you're getting from the grocery store has added phosphorus in it? It's not required to be on the nutrition facts label. And if it is on the nutrition facts label, I want you to ignore it. No one should be counting their phosphorus intake unless you're a researcher. Not all phosphorus is created equal. It's going to just confuse you. What I would prefer you to look at instead is the ingredient list. The ingredient list are those tiny little words they put on the package that you almost need a microscope to be able to see. What you're looking for in the ingredient list is any word that has the letters P-H-O-S in it, FOSS. So let's take a look at a few examples. On this one, we have um, two mixes, like boxes of, of powdery mix in them. They're from the baking aisle. The first one is a pancake mix. The second one is a brownie mix. So mix number one, what I'm looking for is any word with P-H-O-S in it, right? So looking around and immediately I see aluminum phosphate, monocalcium phosphate, and dipotassium phosphate. This pancake mix is no good. Please don't eat it. Now looking at the second mix, I'm looking around, trying to find any word with PHOS in it, and I don't see anything. So this baking mix would be a better choice. No added phosphorus. Let's look at another example. These are sodas or colas or pop, whatever you want to call it, depending on what part of the country you're from. But cola number one, I'm looking around for any word that has PHOS. I see high fructose corn syrup. I see artificial flavors. I don't see anything with PHOS. That one's a good one. The second one, however, I'm looking at it and immediately I see phosphoric acid. That stuff is powerful. This type of beverage you definitely want to avoid. So last, last example is gonna be some artificial milks. The first one is an almond milk. I'm looking for FOS, P-H-O-S. Searching around in there, I don't see any word with FOS in it. That one's a good choice. The second one is a coconut milk. Looking around for phosphorus. And uh-oh, I see dipotassium phosphate. So this particular coconut milk is not going to be good. And I just want to tell you, the best thing that you can do is to try to limit the amount of processed foods that you eat, right? Instead of having all this processed foods, try cooking your own food at home. It's the best thing that you can do for your health. There are a lot of other food additives besides phosphorus that are in processed foods that are supposed to be excreted by the kidneys. And if your kidneys aren't working well, we're not really sure what, what is happening in the body, but it might not be good. Um, I know we don't live in the 1700s. You're going to use some processed foods, but as little as possible is the best prescription. So let's move on to phosphorus in blood. The normal range for phosphorus in your blood is 2.5 to 4.5 milligrams per deciliter. If you start to get on the high range of that, your nephrologist, that's a kidney doctor, or your dietitian might tell you to start following a low phosphorus diet. If your phosphorus starts to get to five milligrams per deciliter or higher, they will likely also prescribe you a phosphorus binder. There are many different types of phosphorus binders out there on the market. I will do a video that breaks down each one of them. However, I can tell you that the ones on the market right now all work in a similar way. And what you're gonna do is take this medication before you eat. So right before you eat a meal or a snack or within a, the first few bites, you're gonna to wanna to take your phosphorus binder medication. Some people take their binder in the middle of the meal or the end of the meal because they can't stand it. They're having nausea from it. So it's better if they take it later on. That's totally fine, no judgment. It's just not gonna work as effectively. So exactly how does it work though? Let's look at this uh, very simplified graphic of a person's and their stomach. They seem to have eaten a meal that has phosphorus in it and they didn't take their binder yet, uh-oh. But what, what happens when they do take their binder, that binder medicine will grab a hold of phosphorus in the food and prevent the body from absorbing it. And the higher dose of phosphorus binder a person takes, the more phosphorus um, coverage they're going to get. 
However, you know, your doctor is not going to start you off on a high dose of phosphorus binder. They're going to start you off on the lowest dose possible because nobody wants to take more medication than they need, right? But I wanted to just say a little thing here. That natural phosphorus from protein-containing foods that we talked about before, phosphorus binders work very well against that type of phosphorus. But the same might not be able to be said about that artificial or inorganic phosphorus. The jury is out on how effective phosphorus binders are against these. And in fact, they might not be effective at all, which makes those um, added phosphorus even worse for you. So we talked about naturally occurring phosphorus. We talked about artificially occurring phosphorus. We didn't talk about restaurant meals. Okay, when you go out to dinner, how do you know that the lemonade that you ordered is not from a powdered mix that has phosphorus in it? You don't. You're not in the kitchen. You can't read a, an ingredient list. Um, what about the, the chicken that you got, the breaded chicken? Does it have added phosphorus? You don't know. So anytime you go out to a restaurant, it's a gamble. It's better for you to spend your money and your time at home. Make cooking at home an experience. Involve your family. Bring your friends over. Take a cooking class. Invest in different herbs and spices. So a lot of people ask me about wet cooking methods. Wet cooking methods can be used to decrease the amount of phosphorus in protein foods like meat. And I'm talking about uh, wet cooking could be boiling or it could be cooking food in a pressure cooker. And this type of food cooking does work. It will remove the phosphorus from the meat and pull it into the water that you're using to cook with. Of course, you want to throw that water out. But the smaller that you can cut that meat, the more phosphorus is going to come out. That, that, that's helpful. And also making sure you're not using hard water is also helpful for getting the, a bigger reduction of phosphorus. Um, the consensus is that you'll decrease the phosphorus in that protein food by about 50%. And we already said that natural phosphorus and foods is not absorbed very well already so this can be this might actually be worth your time especially if you're struggling with phosphorus control so the next thing i wanted to talk about oh yeah there are a lot of people out there who not only have to have a low phosphorus diet but they also need a low potassium diet if that is you please check out my video on all about potassium in the future, I'll do a video that combines both of those food restrictions, but for now, they're going to be separate. Sorry about that. And then finally, I wanted to talk about um, those of you who have ended up um, needing dialysis, or maybe you need it in the future. When you um, are on dialysis, the dialysis machine will remove phosphorus from your blood. It can be very important for, for saving your life. It removes other things too, not just phosphorus. For most people, they dialyze about three times a week for between three to five hours each time. And they're gonna get some good phosphorus reduction. But it's becoming a trend, a very good trend if you ask me, for people to dialyze more frequently. Uh, for example, dialyzing for two hours most days of the week. That type of dialysis it has such a big impact on your phosphorus. There are people that were on a lot of phosphorus binders before, and then when they switch to frequent hemodialysis, the amount of phosphorus binders they take is reduced. So if you were on hemodialysis, it might be something to talk to your nephrologist about. Okay, that's it for this video. But I want you to understand that only your medical team who knows you personally and knows all your medical history can diagnose you with any illness and prescribe you with an appropriate diet. Not me, I don't know you. But if you've already been prescribed that diet, this video is intended to help supplement what information they've already provided to you about phosphorus and maybe to stimulate a little conversation between you and your healthcare team. Maybe you'll learn a few new things. And um, well, sometimes it just helps to hear somebody say the exact same thing that your dietitian told you, but in a different way. And I, I hope it's benefited you. So this is Kitty Cat saying goodbye, stay healthy and strong.